It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about her. Our speaker today is a former television reporter and anchor of 10 years, yapping it up and reporting in both Albany and Syracuse for the 24-hour news station YNN. She's an award-winning journalist, honored most recently by the Syracuse Press Club in the areas of Best Investigative Series and Best Miniseries. She recently appeared on the Oxygen Network in a show called Snap, which highlighted the Stacy Castor case, uh, the case of a woman found guilty of murdering her husband with antifreeze. Don't think about it. Jolene covered this murder trial extensively as a journalist, and the story made headlines across the globe. But on to better and brighter things. Today, she's a freelance writer and speaker aimed at one goal, helping people understand that they can have, do, or be anything that they want. So please help me welcome her here today, Ms. Jolene DeRosier. Yeah, yeah, thanks guys. Thank you very much. Uh, as the man said, the name is Jolene DeRosier. I'm not related to anybody in this room either. Um, <laughs> actually, that's a lie. My name is not Jolene DeRosier, not anymore, because I took the vows. I took the big step. My last name is actually, thank you, it wasn't that long ago. My new last name is actually Moody. Three guesses as to why I don't use it. You'd be surprised at the people who think they're very original with their jokes. Oh, is that your disposition? <laughs> yeah. Especially with customer service. I got to watch it with customer service because they'll nail me. Because you know after I hang up the phone, oh, she lives up to her last name. <laughs> so it's still DeRosier in this world. And ironically, um, that's how Westerners are viewed by my last name, Moody. They're viewed as moody, tense, cranky. All of those fall under what we know as depression. <laughs> I put that in for an extra kick, you guys like that? Yeah. Uh, but it all falls under depression and recently I was watching MSNBC and they did a um, uh, nationwide poll. 85% of Americans are considered depressed. 85%. That's almost all of us. Save a few and save that noise right there. Um, and under the, the subtitle of depression, you have moody, crank, tense, irritable. Have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen it when you're driving to work and you look to your left and your right and you see those people? If it's not you, it's them. An interesting story. Um, the first time the Dalai Lama ever came over to the U.S., and as most of you know, the Dalai Lama is the spiritual teacher, the head of state in Tibet. And he came over to address a group and as the organizers were taking him over, he was in a limousine and he's doing, he's in, in traffic and he's doing the same thing. He's looking to the left and his right and he's seeing these people in their cars and they're, they're tense and they're angry. And he asked the organizers, why is everybody so angry? And they said, that's how Americans are. And they moved on and they went to the hotel room and the TV was on. And I don't, I don't know what he was watching, but he saw the same thing in the television show. He saw that anger. And the organizer said to him, you need to be prepared because when you address these people, you're going to see the self-loathing they have for themselves. They're going to take your teaching and they're going to use it against themselves because they're not living in that way. And the Dalai Lama couldn't relate to this because over in Tibet, they have it going on. It's called Buddha nature. I'm not here to turn you into Buddhists. I just borrowed this from these group of people because they are so peaceful. Buddha nature is basically living in the moment and loving every second of it. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So it was something he couldn't quite understand. Is that, oh, that's the guy buzzing. He's, he's doing something over there. I thought you had something going on your walls. I've heard ghost stories about this place. <laughs> so I visited this campus several years ago. Um, so in any event, he was very confused by the way people live because they don't live like that over there. When something happens in their life, a tragedy, a loss of somebody, they deal with it, they process it, and they move on. And that's a foreign concept to some of us because we love to live in the past and you cannot pull us out and don't you dare try. Isn't that, doesn't that happen sometimes when you, when you find those moments that you just want to live in and you want to be angry? Nobody's going to pull you out. No matter what they say or what they do, that's where you want to be. And that's because we're conditioned in this way. So there's two ways to pull out of these moments that you get trapped in. It's changing your perspective. The first way is finding the other side of things. When you're in negative situations, I'm not going to say find the positive because it's not always positive, but there's another side. And the other way is accepting what is. So we're going to talk about both of these this morning. The first one being finding the other side. 
Hi there, we were waiting for you. <laughs> when you find the other side of things, what I mean by that is, is you focus on what you become. So when you focus on a negative situation, negative, negative, negative things roll in. When you focus on a positive situation, positive things come to you. And that's not hokey. Has anyone ever heard of the movie The Secret? Dismiss it if you saw it. It was a good movie, it had a good message, but those that marketed the movie were brilliant because they knew how to pull people in because we believe that we can have things instantly. It's called instant gratification. And the idea of that movie was to introduce you to what is known as the law of attraction. And in the law of attraction, if you think it, you get it. I'd like a cup of coffee, it doesn't magically appear. But the law of attraction does exist. Like attracts like. Whether you believe it or not, it exists. And there was a scientist that wanted to prove this in 1992 in Switzerland. So what he did is he basically took a particle of matter, an atom, which we're all made up of. You, 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 we're all made up of the same thing, this table. I remember a teacher in eighth grade telling me that and I thought, you're a nut job. I'm not made of the same material of this table, but we're all made of these atoms, of these particles of matter. So just to get scientific for a minute, in 1992, this doctor took this atom and he split it in half. He sent one seven miles this way and the other seven miles this way. And there were reporters everywhere watching this, science, journals, things like that. And when he split the atom in half, they were physically separated, but on an infrared camera, and if you're interested in more of this later, I can lead you to more information. On an infrared camera, the energy started to come back together. You guys know anybody that are twins? Anybody know a set of twins? Have you ever noticed, I don't know, some twins do it better than others. They can think or finish each other's thoughts. They're the closest to being a split atom that you can imagine. You and I, you and you, all of us, we're, we're all so close that it's absolutely positive, possible to attract like things and to attract like people. When you're in negative situations or around negative people, you feel drained. Has anyone ever experienced that? You're like, oh my God, would you stop? You're killing me. There are people like that. I worked with a girl like that. Her name was Kat. God love her. This was when I worked in TV land. We were reporters. I worked the day shift. She worked the night shift. So she worked 2 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And she was this tiny little thing. And she'd come in with her Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee. She didn't look at anybody. She had these big old eyes. And she set the coffee down. I'd say, hey, Kat, good morning. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if it's a good morning. That was her shift, the 2 to 11. It was still her morning shift. And that's how she went into it, instantly went into it negatively. And I'm not kidding you when I say she almost always had something negative happen to her overnight. The mast on the live truck would freeze. No live hit for Kat. She'd come back to edit her video. Something broke down, it couldn't work. She didn't get it on time for 11 o'clock. And then the next morning when she waddled in with a little iced coffee, I'd say, hey Kat, how's it going? Not very good. And she'd tell me about the night before. There was a scenario, she went to a school board meeting to cover some big vote. She gets there, someone on the school board had a heart attack and she was a very well-known person in the community. Kat was so upset by the fact that she wasn't gonna have a story at 11 o'clock, she wasn't smart enough to cover the fact that the woman had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And what happened the next day when she waddled in with her iced coffee? She wasn't very happy with herself because she was so wrapped in that negativity. Does anybody know someone like that that just lives in it? Any head nods? Yeah, yeah. Um, when I talk about finding the other side of things I mentioned earlier, there aren't always positives and negatives. Today, ironically, marks two years that my mother passed away. And I experienced what was called delayed mourning, which I didn't know I existed until I, I looked into it because I thought, God, this is not so bad. I'm handling this well. But eight months later, it hit me, and it hit me hard. And I used to wake up in the middle of the night and I'd cry and cry and I have a wonderful husband, you know, he'd soothe me, rub my back. What I was most upset about was the fact that I no longer had that nuclear family. It was my mom, my dad, my brother and me and it was gone. My father and I are estranged, unfortunately. My mom is gone and my brother is a hermit. He's one of those people, he doesn't get out, you know, unless you really force him to come out. So my mother was the one that would always have the dinners at Christmas and Thanksgiving, so that's when I'd see my brother. So I was mourning the loss of my entire family. And he, he, I, I would not let him in. I lived in that bubble. He wasn't gonna bust it, my bubble of misery for five or six nights straight. And finally he said to me, very carefully, because he knew I would attack him, why don't you look at the other side? And I said, there is no other side. 
What, what, how, how is there another side to the death of somebody you love? And he said, she's not suffering anymore. And we've all heard that, right? I'm going to tell you, when I used to hear that, it meant nothing to me. I didn't understand it. But my mother was sick. She had a lung disease. And there's truth to that. She's not suffering anymore. She doesn't have to run around with a mask on her face. She doesn't have to struggle for air. She doesn't have to feel awful or be miserable. She's at peace. He also said, you do have family. You have my family. I thought, you're right, I have a father-in-law. I'm not used to this terminology, by the way. I still don't call him dad. I'm not used to it. I have a sister-in-law, a brother-in-law, new nieces and nephews. A whole new family was born. So I chose to find the other side. Instead of dwelling in the negative and the boo-hoo-ness of it, I looked for the brighter stuff and I was able to find it. There's no doubt that your brain will fight you on this. Because when you're in that mode and you're in that mood, that's exactly where you want to stay. You know, you get people coming up to you, it's going to be okay. No, it's not. Leave me alone. It's not going to be okay. But you have to work on it. We're going to do a little example right now. This is so funny because I think of these colors that when I walk in the room, I see them. Right now, I want you to take a look around the room and find things in the room that are green. And I didn't pre-choose this color. I'm looking at the rug going, up. Oh, there's one. We have the rug. What else is green? Sure. Quest. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren <Shirt. laughs> there's, there's green there. So we have two green shirts. We have the napkins, right? We have your shirt. We have the rug. Now close your eyes. Oh, <laughs> my eyes are green. I'm going to keep mine open. Close your eyes. John, close them. Close them. Now I want you to recall everything in the room that you saw that was blue. <laughs> what happened? You know why? No. You were focused on the green because I told you to. In this example, the green is the negative stuff. Does the color blue exist? Absolutely it does. The blue is the positive stuff. It's been there all along. So it's a matter of perception. It's a matter of changing your perspective. It does exist. When you go into things feeling negative, you're going to come out feeling that. And yes, your brain will fight you. But I challenge you, what have you got to lose? Just flip things around. We'll play a little game. We'll do an example. The little pamphlets in front of you that were so nicely put together. Right in the front, traffic jam scenario. My car's the one in the back. It's the Mercedes. No, <laughs> I don't own one. Are you kidding me? It's a Hyundai. Um, fold it in half. You've got, well, no, she wrote down positives and negatives. Fold it in half so all you see are the negatives. Okay? And I want you to be serious about this, okay? Because this is going to stimulate your brain and that's what we need to do. Let's talk right now about five things that suck about being in a traffic jam. Anybody? Shout it out. Time. You're wasting time. You're late. Go ahead and write it down. Waste, waste of gas. Waste of gas. That's a good one. I haven't heard that one, surprisingly enough, with gas prices. Wait. Say it again. How does that affect you, though? That, that's a good one. But talk about like what's going to really burn really you up right when you're the sitting there. <laughs> yeah. Spends a lot of time in Vietnam. Air quality. <laughs> <laughs> I had one woman tell me during one of these she wasn't going to get the good donut <laughs> because she was late. There's a guy that brings them in every Tuesday. He lays the whole thing out, two boxes of Dunkin' Donuts. By the time she gets there, all she gets is the old-fashioned one. And what's more, somebody cut it in half to save calories. So that was hers, was the donuts. Um, anything else about being late? It's going to be off schedule all day. You're going to be, it does, it, it sets you off kilter immediately. And you sit there in the car and you're fuming about it. And if you look to your left and your right, like we were talking about, they're fuming too. They're not very happy. You're going to be late. You probably have a supervisor that's going to give you the eye. Or if you're working in a team with other people, they're not going to be happy about it. So it sets your whole day off, just like you said. Your car's not a transformer. Just... You can't lift it up and move. Okay. Yeah, you feel helpless and you're angry. Sometimes you beat yourself up because you've been on that perfect schedule and that'll just, it'll mess the whole day up. Now let's change our perspective, turn the paper over. Most of you don't do this when you're stuck in a traffic jam, so you're gonna do it now. What's a good time about being stuck in a traffic jam? What makes it okay? <laughs> yeah. Play Tetris on your phone, that's what I do. I'm about to do a book on CD and finish the chapter. Time to think, yes, I do that. I do the same thing, I'm like, yes, I can finish this chapter, yes. 
I have a friend who, um, she also does this for a living. She's a humorist. Uh, she keeps clown noses and these cardboard smiley faces in her card. No kidding, she opens the glove box and she puts the clown nose on and she looks at the person next to her that's grumbling and she very slowly raises a smile. <laughs> and boy, does that tick those people off. <laughs> they smile, it's a little creepy. They smile eventually. What else is a positive thing about being stuck in that car? What if you have a meeting and you're not prepared for it? I guess you can buff your nails or something. Buff your nails? Look at the other side of things. You know, there's, um, do you do overflow parking here? Like if there's not a parking spot available? Like one of the negative things there's is never <laughs> there's never parking so you have to walk. Maybe you look at the other side of things. Maybe you've been talking about getting more exercise and taking better care of yourself. Look at it like that. I could use that little walk. So there's always positives and I challenge you the next time you're in a traffic jam and you come up over that hill and you come down, take a deep breath, go, okay, Jolene, this better work or so help me, I'm gonna find you. And look for the positives. Just let it be. There was a study done actually, it wasn't that long ago, it was probably three or four years ago, and I think it was strictly in New York State, so I might be wrong, but it was done on traffic formation. And it was a computer program that did it, and basically they studied the formation of ants, and they understood, and this is, if you think about it, it's absolutely true, that if we acted and worked like ants as vehicles and allowed ourselves to merge and share and sh there wouldn't be a traffic jam. There'd be no such thing as a traffic jam. But we are so hell-bent on taking care of ourselves and not anybody else that it doesn't work that way. Not yet. So just practice trying to be positive and changing your perspective. And again, your brain will fight you, but if you do this in different scenarios, you do it in the workplace. You're gonna be amazed with a change, I promise you. It'll tickle your tummy, you'll be like, oh my gosh, this isn't so bad. Um, the second part of changing your perspective is accepting what is. Does anybody know what I mean by that? What does that mean? You can't change it. Just let it go. But boy, do we fight it? Don't we fight it? When we get in that car and that traffic jam is like that, we bang on the steering wheel, it really ticks us off. Like I said, your car's not a transformer. It's not gonna lift up and walk over the crowd. It is what it is. The first time I ever heard this phrase was a brilliant man by the name of Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Eckhart Tolle. I didn't understand that at first. I'm like, except what is? I don't want to. I don't like this. This is not the way I wanted it to be. Well, that's the way it is. Do you realize if we accepted what is, the amount of stress that we wouldn't carry on ourselves, we create a large percentage of our own suffering. We do it single-handedly. Not necessarily people around you, they certainly contribute, but you are a large part of who you are and why. Because you resist the present. We live in the past where people didn't do nice things to us or did things to upset us, or we jump to the future where, if only, when, when I get that house, things will be better. When I get my new car, things will be better. When I drop 20 pounds, things will be better. And you're never living in the now. So that's one of Eckhart Tolle's big things is accepting what is and living with the now. And it is a challenge and a shift because our society, we're not built that way. We are built, we want that instant gratification. We want it now. We're so conditioned to that. You can turn on any TV, you see the most perfect person in the world. It's frustrating because that's what they want us to believe. You can have it now. You can lose 20 pounds now. You can buy this car now. You can have this loan now, 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 now. You gotta live in the moment. It doesn't happen that quickly. Everything takes work. Seems like we figure that out the older we get. Um, some years ago, I was in TV for 10 years, but I had a little hiatus in the middle where they always say in TV, if, you, if you're not laid off, then you're still a virgin to the business because there's always a station somewhere that's gonna lose money and people get laid off. Well, that happened to me. So I was out of work for um, about nine months as far as TV went, but I was lucky enough to get a job selling mortgages. I didn't get my Regents Diploma in New York State because I got a 64 on my math exam. I'm not a numbers person at all. So here I am sitting at a desk trying to sell mortgages. And I had the confidence that I could do it, but I had to be patient. And the guy that trained me, his name was John Berkmere, who ironically is doing my mortgage right now for a house we're in the process of buying. Uh, he's done this for 20 years. He's a very good guy. He's a God-loving man, so he's got faith like I've never seen. And he taught me the process. Well, what I started to notice is people would come in to get their loan, and I would try to qualify them, 
and they wouldn't qualify for very much. As most of you know, the amount you can borrow is based on a debt to income ratio. How much do you make? How much of it do you spend? Equals the amount you can borrow. And lots of the loans are FHA loans, so it's federal money. So I'm not telling you the bank's not going to give it to you. I'm telling you the federal government's not going to give it to you. Well, guess who they get angry at? Me. And they tell me I can't do my job and that I don't know what I'm talking about. And they're going to go down the road to the other bank and that's that. And they go out the door and here's me. I'm devastated and I take it personal. So I go down the hall to John after this happens four or five times and I'm like, I don't know what to do and I'm really upset about this. They're, they're getting so angry at me and I don't know what to do and they paid me the first three months I was there. It was commission after that so I had to get on the ball with this. But not if people are walking out the door. And he's watching me get upset and he's crossing his arms and he's slowly grinning. I'm like, John, what are you grinning at? There's nothing funny about this. He said, do you want this to stop? Do you want this to change? I'm like, yes. He goes, then accept that that's how it is. I went, what? Accept that that's how it is when people walk in the door. They're going to be angry at you. You're the one sitting in front of them. How many of you get in fights with your spouses and it's nothing they've ever done? It's the situation that you left at work and you come home and you take it out on them. It's the same scenario. He said, just accept that this is the process and that they're not going to be very happy with you and watch it disappear. I thought the man was nuts, but I tried it. And a few days later, sure enough, a woman came in. She made over $100,000, but she had a huge debt load. I could only qualify her for $40,000. You can't buy a house for $40,000. She thought I was wrong. And I said I was a numbers person, but I had this part down. The math wasn't that difficult. And I explained to her, we can work this out. We can help you reduce your debt load. We can do whatever we need. We'll get you that house. It won't be today. She told me I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was talking about. I'm going to a bank down the road. And I politely said, okay, well, if you have any questions, come back. I'm happy to answer them. Big smile. She walked out the door and I felt nothing. Her anger was directed at me, but she, I think she knew that she did have a problem. I'm telling you three days later, she was back in my office groveling. I'm so sorry. Will you help me? The other bank wouldn't even help her reduce the debt load. And she came back. So by me changing my perspective and accepting that this is what happens when you sell mortgages, it just kind of disappeared because you can't change it. Sometimes you, um, we were just talking about that you work with people that don't get it and that they can't accept what is. When that happens, you just accept that that's how it is. My grandmother always says, takes all kinds to make a world. And you're looking at every piece of it right here. Um, I also worked at Applebee's. I was a bartender for a long time. And I didn't know what I was doing at the time when I tell you this story. But you know, being young, I think I was probably 21 or 22, the last place I wanted to be on a Saturday afternoon was slinging drinks behind a bar. I wanted to be out playing in the sun. I wanted to be with my friends. I'm 22 years old. And so there were some times when I begrudgingly went into work. I just didn't want to do it. And I'd get in my car with my stupid little Applebee's uniform. Now they get to wear the plain black shirts and they look okay, but we had these obnoxious colors, big apple on it. And I get in the car and I would drive to work. And one time I was driving to work and it was a beautiful day. And I remember there was a guy riding a bike towards me. And I was kind of mad that he, could t he was going to have a good day and I wasn't. And I rolled down the window and I went, Woohoo! I'm going to work! Yeah, buddy! And the look. <laughs> and it made me laugh. And so I did it again. Pulled up to a stop sign. There's kids dancing in the spring. I'm like, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. And the same thing, the kids. <laughs> and I felt this change in me because I was laughing at myself my energy actually shifted. That by the time I walked in the door and I saw the regular sitting there and I waved, it was okay. And I did it again the next day. I thought, I'm gonna try this again, and I did. Random people shouting and waving as I'm going to work. My brother calls me while he's driving. At the time I had one of those flip cell phones. I don't have it anymore, I got this crazy looking thing. He's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to work, yeah, woo! He's like, what the hell is wrong with you? I said, Sean, I don't know, but I've been doing this when I don't want to go to work, and I don't mind going to work. He called me a nut job. But it worked because I changed my perspective. I changed that energy field around me. 
And then when I'd walk in and I'd see those smiling faces, hey, Jolene, how's it going? It wasn't bad. It really wasn't so bad because I turned things around. I basically learned to accept, breathe, and then change it if I had to. And there's a point I didn't make earlier. If there's a situation that you can't change immediately, it can be changed. You can't do it in that moment when you're in that traffic jam, but you can change it. You go home, you turn the news on in the morning or the radio, and you find out which way to go because of the road construction. That's funny I say that because when I pulled out of my hotel, I wanted to be here on time. And there was all of a sudden road construction. I'm like, I was not prepared for this. I should have been prepared for this. It wasn't there last night. I know I went over to Tops and, and the road construction was there. And sure enough, the guy puts up the flag for me. I'm like, you're kidding. I took my deep breath and I said, I will get there. I know how to get there. I'll be just fine. So it's, it's accepting, working with the circumstances you have and moving on. And I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and say when you do it once, your entire life's going to change. It takes work. It took you a long time to become the person you are. It's going to take a little bit to make the change. And for people that say, well, why bother? Do you want to wake up miserable? Do you want to go through each day begrudgingly? You are the one that has the power. You are the one that has the power to make the change. Nobody else. And I'm telling you, and I promise you, when you do this, amazing things are going to happen. Doors are going to open that you didn't even know existed. Random things are going to appear, like talents you didn't know you had. Goals that you always wanted to reach and never did because of fear. Because you've changed your perspective. Those people that are out there that are running around smiling and enjoying their life and you're cursing them, why do you think that they're having a good time and you're not? Because you're in that negative mode. That's what you're attracting. That's exactly what you're going to get. And if you don't believe it, just for the hell of it, try it. Try it one day. Try it one day when you go into work. There's nothing easy about going into the workplace when there's that many people there not able to do the work, so you've got to do the work instead. And what are you doing? Oh, I got to do this. Why do I have to do it? It's not fair. It is what it is. Accept that it's what it is. And here, here's something I urge you to do. You are all amazing, wonderful, productive people because you're still sitting here. You're still doing your jobs. Let your coworkers know. That was awesome, by the way. That was fantastic. That it changes you. There was a period of time when I was working in TV. Do they get YNN up here? You guys get YNN? Um, I think it was five or six years ago, they split the stations because they spent too much money building the station. They sent all the anchors out to Albany. But if you were reporting in the city like Syracuse, in my ear, if I had an IFB in my ear, it would be the anchor in Albany. Well, those anchors, after they left the station in Syracuse, it was a really rough time for our newsroom. None of us felt appreciated. We were taking on huge workloads because they just split everybody up everywhere. And we used to talk on a system, it's called ENPS, and you can send messages that they call top lines. So if I wanted to send a message to the anchor in Albany, they'd get it instantly. It's like text messaging, pretty much. And at least two or three times a week, either the anchor or the director or somebody would say to me, they would top line me, Jolene, that was a great story. Jolene, great use of sound. Wow, that was fantastic. That kept me coming in every single day. And so I returned the favor. And not just to return the favor, because I knew how it made me feel. <coughs> Knowing what our newsroom was going through, that people did not want to walk in, that they, it was completely ripped apart because this conglomerate wasn't bright enough to not spend so much money. Now people have to lift their families up out of Syracuse and move to a completely different city and leave us with our knees shaking because we didn't know how to do this. But you know what? We did it. We did it because we all turned to each other. We're all human beings. We're not robots. We're not just another person. We are all connected to one another. Please keep that in mind. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what choices you've made in the past, how old you are, or what you've done. You can have, do, and be anything you want. I was told by another speaker, you should change that phrase, don't use that phrase, it's overused. I can't find a better way to say it. I tried to attribute that phrase to whoever, I've heard Jack Canfield say it, he's the chicken soup for the soul guy. I'm not sure who actually came up with it. And what I found was that it was Abraham Lincoln that came up with the closest quote of that, and I have it in full, I'm not gonna read it to you. 
but maybe over the years it trickled down because people realized it's the truth because we forget the power of our minds because our society doesn't want to we don't they don't want us to know we have the power we can do whatever we want we're so conditioned to think we're just little robots and we have to do what we're told it's all up to you um, I gotta tell you this story I stole it from another speaker but it's it's pretty powerful um, there's a guy by the name of oh my god is it Jim Donovan his name just escaped me Jim was an alcoholic for many years and uh, after hitting the bottom he swam back to the top and he went through recovery and he lived in New York City lives in New York City he speaks a lot on the West Coast but during his time instead of taking the time to drink he would walk around the city or he'd jump on his treadmill doing whatever he could to get his mind off the bottle while he was in recovery so one day he sees the circus coming into Madison Square Garden and they're bringing the animals up to the fifth floor and he's curious so he follows them in and uh, he sees the giraffes are over here and they have to literally remove the ceiling tiles just so the giraffes can get their heads up and then over here they're setting up the elephants and the trainers putting all the the hay down and he sees the the trainer take this big round weight that's very I mean he's this guy can lift it up and he puts the weight down over a stake and then he takes a chain and he connects it to this elephant and it's not very long you know it's maybe maybe six feet and the elephant just looks at him chews his cut or whatever and he keeps going and Jim says to the trainer aren't you afraid that elephants gonna take off down Lincoln Tunnel the trainer says no he's not going anywhere He's like, it's, it's, what is it, a 25 pound weight? And the trainer explains to him, when the elephants are babies, they nail that stake into the grass, very, very low, and they put the chain on him and that elephant will pull and he'll pull and he'll pull and pull and he'll try to get off and he'll stop. And a few hours later, he'll try again and he'll pull and he'll keep pulling and pulling on that chain trying to escape and he can't. And after a week or two, he completely gives up. And he continues to grow, conditioned to the fact that he's not going anywhere. So my question to you is, what chains are holding you back? Is it self-loathing? Is it the frustration you feel at work? Is it stuff at home? What holds you back from being the best you can be? I don't know any of you, and you may not believe me when I say this, but it's the truth. You don't know how badly I want people to love their lives. It's sickening because I lived that life where I was unhappy. That's why I do what I do now. Because everybody has power, they don't even know, they can't even begin to understand the power of your mind and what it can do and open up for you. I have one more story. And um, this is a great story, I actually stumbled upon it very recently. <clears throat> I do freelance writing and one of the clients I write for is a vineyard in the Thousand Islands called Coyote Moon Vineyards. I know this is vineyard country. Um, but it's a great little vineyard and basically they hire me to write about their events and I'll go and I'll cover their events and then it gets published on their website and then again in the Thousand Island Sun. <coughs> so the proprietors are Phil and Mary Randazzo. And um, Phil used to be, does anyone remember Fantastic Sam's? It was like a hair cutting chain. Phil is from California. He's the guy that started this. And the chain grew and people brought fran franchises everywhere and then he sold it and he made millions of dollars. And I guess he had family up in St. Lawrence, or on the St. Lawrence River, so that's why this guy from California moved his family to the North Country to build a vineyard. He wanted to build something for his family. So anyway, part of the people that work there are family, and the other part are other employees. He said, I want a story about everybody that works here. And I want you to start with my wife, Mary. Um, Mary is an artist. She paints local landmarks. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll write the story. And I'll be honest, I thought, you know, what is it? You wanted to be an artist ever since you were little, and you used to practice. You'd cut your hair off your dolls and use that as paintbrushes. I don't know. These are the stories I'm expecting, your typical story. And uh, I sit down with her, and uh, I ask the first basic question. Okay, when did you start painting? She says, well, let me tell you a story. And she's got the southern twang because she's originally from North Carolina, transplanted to California and then up to the North Country. And she says, there was one time I was driving through a canyon in California and I came up over this hill and I came down into the valley and over over here was a field and in the field was this giant beautiful majestic tree and she thought to herself I'm gonna paint that and she had a camera in the car she thought I'm gonna take a picture of that tree and I'm gonna paint that tree but she had errands to run and she was visiting a friend too so she thought you know what when I come back through I'll pull over and I'll take a picture of the tree and I'll paint it so she drove into town 
and she ran her errands and she visited her friend and she came back on the other side came up over the hill came down looked over in the field and there in the field was the tree on its side wrapped in chains and there were men around it and she was devastated by this and she pulled her truck over and she watched and she said I laughed and I cried at the same time and I said why and she said because once again I was a day late and a dollar short I wanted to paint that tree all my life I wanted to paint and I saw the first thing I wanted to paint and I lost my chance apparently the local county the county was clearing the land to build condos and they ripped this tree out and she learned it was 300 years old later she put her car back in drive and she drove to the nearest art store and she bought canvas and paint and she bought how-to books and she taught herself how to paint when she drove through that valley Mary Randazza was 40 years old she's 65 years old today and she just won her first set of awards for her painting it is displayed in the Clayton Art Museum there is a copy of a print in Larry King's office which she's very proud of and there's also a copy in the postmaster's office in DC and and that's what I mean is it doesn't matter where you are in life or what your struggles are you were born to be great and I know that it's possible and I I encourage you to explore your world to love your life and to live with purpose so keep that in mind we're gonna take a short break and when you guys come back we're gonna play a game okay all right thank you very much Thank you.